So we've been on the series for the summer called the Parables of the Kingdom. And we said in the parables, through riddles, through um, paradoxes, through many different lenses, that the kingdom can be seen if you pay close attention enough in odd places, in remote places, in places you never think that God moves or hear his voice or see him and his spirit move through the power of God and the people of God. Today, I want to give us a curious analogy that Jesus gives us in this text. And his analogy of not what the kingdom is or the description of that kingdom. He says to enter that kingdom this kingdom that we've been talking about the whole summer, is you have to become like a child. He said, actually, he uses a negative connotation and says, if you, you will never enter. Some, tell someone next to you, never. never. Now that's extreme language, okay? Now he says, you'll never enter this kingdom unless for one, you need one association one ontological essence, one identity. He says, you have to become like a child. So he describes entrance into this kingdom we've been talking about through the lens of puberty. How many people remember puberty here? How awkward was it? Were you guys cool when your voice was changing? No, you weren't. Most of you guys are smart, so you know you probably were uncool, but you're cool now, okay? You're cool now. Okay, nerds rule the world. But... Um, if you really think about what Jesus is saying in this passage, the analogy is you have to go through an adolescence, a, a puberty, a spiritual puberty, if you will, a spiritual adolescence period to enter this kingdom. In another occasion, Jesus says, actually in John chapter 3, that you have to be born again. Birth, maternity, and puberty. I mean, have you ever raised a baby before? Let me tell you, I think Amin and Jenny are supposed to be here with their new Luca. He's new. <laughs> we got him from the store, picked him up. <laughs> but uh, raising a baby and the process of watching a baby being born will ruin you. Literally and figuratively, because the process of birth is disgusting and messy. <laughs> and expensive. And so Jesus says, to enter the kingdom, you actually have to be born again. You have to go through this childbirth, and you have to go through puberty. What kind of identification is he making here? Well, if salvation and the very ontological essence of salvation is analogous to birth and, and adolescence and puberty, then it's always going to be something of a mess. And so sometimes when people come to churches, they go, why is such a mess? I thought this is supposed to be perfect. No. <laughs> the process of salvation is always a hot mess. People annoy you. They're in process. Sometimes they curse you out. They're in doubt. They're in question. They leave the church and they come back to the church. They, you know, and then there's all this type of etymology. And I have a teen at home and a baby. And let me tell you, there are two stages Some in in. In when you raise kids, psychologically anyway, it, it terrifies you. The first one is a good stage. The first stage is when you call the baby, you know, beautiful, innocent, fun child. Okay, it's called the innocent stage. And then there's the evil stage. This is the teen stage. And I, I'm at the tension of those two things in my house right now. And let me tell you, let me, let me first start with the teen stage, because that's most fun. The teen stage is when your son, I have one, <laughs> and the teen stage is when he tries to disassociate himself with you. He says, I believe this. I don't believe what you believe. I don't even like you. I'm just living here because you had me and I have to. I don't even want to hang out with you, right? I mean, it's, it's an evil stage and they question everything. They have different beliefs even. And so when you come to the church, or when, when you say, well, I'm not a Christian, I don't affiliate with that identity, and identity is so big today in our culture, it permeates everything. This identity politics, gender identity, political identity, religious identity. We, we say, well, I associate myself with this tribe of thinking. 
And so when people come to church, you think people come from different stages of identity. Well, I identify with this and that. And you see what, what the kingdom is saying. What Jesus is saying here is God only identifies with one, one identity. And that's family. Tell someone next to you, family. Family. And so when people go, uh, you know, why does the church exist? Well, the church exists because we're looking for our family that's lost. The prodigal son story in the narrative of Luke 15 is just that. God doesn't see atheist or agnostic or liberal or libertarian or conservative or Buddhist. He sees what? Family. It doesn't matter what my son says to me. I mean, he says a lot of things that he doesn't even know what he's talking about half the time. And he'll do it just to annoy me. That's, he says that's the purpose of his life. And so, <laughs> and so when you come to church, people will say a whole bunch of things. They'll even try to get under your skin. And, and the divide in our politics today and different identities today in our culture, everybody will say, well, I, I don't identify with that. But God, the Father doesn't care what you believe. He what? He's interested in who you are. And that's why the first stage to enter the kingdom is puberty. You have to challenge. You have to question. You have to resist. You have to rebel back and forth, back and forth. I hate you. I love you. I, no, don't leave me. I'm lonely. No, I don't want any time with you. That's my son. That's what he says to me. And then, Daddy, I love you. Can I have some money? <laughs> and when you become a utility. And also people who say they have no affiliation to God, but sometimes when they're in trouble, God, I'll make a deal with you. So, so that's the door of the kingdom is you, your, your family. And, you know, one of the colossal mistakes of the church period in the Dark Ages is that we went trying to, in, in, you know, in the the Crusades trying to convert people into belief systems when really they were our lost family members. And the way we reach approach family and sovereign states are totally different ways. You know, ISIS is a manifestation of the Crusades. It's a manifest destiny of the Islamic world. That's what the Crusades were. We can't treat people who, who don't believe what we believe or don't identify with us like anything else except family members that are going through a a stage. And so Jesus says, you got to become like this child. He gives the analogy of puberty. And that's why we need, we created this event called Desserts in the Sun. Because let me tell you, I have two sons. We go in the car. It's World War III every day. And I, I, you know, I tell people I can solve world problems just through the analogy of my kids in the car. Because basically, humanity, they're all related. We're all the same species trying to fight for territory and what? Entitlements. And they're always fighting for the back in the suburban of the car. Who's going to lie down? And Nathan goes, oh, you're, you know, Josh goes, you're so mean. You're, you know, you're bigger than me. You're beating me up. I called it first. And Nathan's like, no, bro, you didn't call that. You didn't call that. I called it first. And uh, you're selfish because I gave it to you yesterday and now I'm taking it today. Josh's like, no. You know, and then he starts crying, and then, and then we're trying to figure out where we're going. We don't even know sometimes. It's so distracting. And, we're, and, and everybody's calling each other's name. I hate you. You know, you're not my brother anymore. I divorce you. <laughs> and then, let me tell you, the problem is solved when we go get ice cream together. Everybody forgets about what they said, what they, they, they just eating ice cream, because in the end of the day, this is what this passage is trying to say. There is no such dichotomy as us and them. The church doesn't have that dichotomy, can't. When the church becomes us versus them, we're making a category that doesn't exist to God the Father. Because the parable of the prodigal son has conflicted and divided characters, but there's what? Still part of the same family. So today... In, in this messy process of what God is doing in us and through us and around us, let's just forget about all that stuff, everything we're going through or where we have to get to, and let's just eat some ice cream because everybody screams for ice cream. And remember, whatever you are in your faith journey, close, far in between, hey, we're conflicted characters. We're going to fight. We're going to love each other, hate each other, make up. 
but we're still part of the same family. That's our mission, and that's why we're in the park four times of the year. We want to get out of our walls of the church and say, this is our mission, to gather our family members together, those who are far from God, close to God, in between, wherever they are, under a tree, at Central Park, talking to each other, eating. And today, ice cream from spot. It'll hit the spot. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Let's stand and pray together. Father, we come before you uh, this afternoon. You know, I remember watching the great cu cultural theologian Lillo and Stitch with my kids. Uh, and, you know, I had to repent in tears because a, a broken Hawaiian family adopts a ugly blue alien named Project 626 and teaches him a Hawaiian phrase, Ohana. And L Lilo teaches Stitch about what family means. And, he, and then she says, family means no one gets left behind or forgotten. And then, you know, I thought to myself, my heart broke. How could a Disney kids film get the heart of God and the gospel better than the church? Because you know what? Stitch didn't even belong in this planet. <laughs> and here we are having problems with different identities. When God the Father only sees lost and found, no categories. You know, when we lost Josh at Disneyland a few years ago, none of us were screaming his political affiliations because he has very strong feelings about Rock Dwayne Johnson being making a good president. But we like, oh, you know, do you know that guy Josh who likes to rock? No, we, we didn't scream out his political preferences. We didn't scream out his religious beliefs. We screamed out his name. And that is what God is doing in the biblical narrative. He's screaming out who we are, not what we identify with, not what we think we believe for now. He's crying out to his kids, just like we did. Let's make this our prayer today. He won't let you go. Will you lift your hands? Let's make this our prayer together. This is what we'll become. This message of one family that's not perfect, conflicted, but still part of one big family of God. He won't let you go. He won't let you go. The moment that you say. The moment that you say. Come and live in me. Come and live in me. Take me all the way. Take me all the way. What he said is true. What he said is true. He will never leave he you. He will never leave you. Forever by your side. Forever by your side. Oh, it's true. Oh, oh it's true. He won't let you go. He won't let you go. Though the seasons change. Though the seasons change. He's never been so close. He's never been so He's just a prayer away. Just a prayer away. When you hear the Father's when call. Hear the Father's call. When he's calling to you. When he's calling to you. Run into his arms. Run into his arms. Don't hesitate to do Don't it. Hesitate to do it. He won't let you go. He won't let you go. When he's forever by your side. Forever by your side. He wants you to know.
Father, we come before you this afternoon. Help us as a faith community, as 180, to never become a church for ourselves, but a church for the city, for a church for the world, a church for our lost family members. You see, when we begin to see every category, every identity as our lost and brothers and sisters, the dichotomy of us and them will dissolve and a love for God's family will be born. Would you be by your heads for the benediction? And whoever's emceeing next for next steps, please come forward. May the love of God and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. All God's people say, amen. God bless you.